There you go. Didn't work. And we are live. Good evening. It's Friday Geeks, and welcome to another edition of the Friday Night Geek Show. I am Dante D, and welcome to the channel where we talk about comic books and other geek stuff. Tonight with me is a freelance comic book creator and writer, Jim O'Connor. Jim, welcome to the show. Hi, dude. How are you doing? Can't complain. It's another day, and uh, I'm talking about comic books and... Uh, that you're always, always feeling the greatest when we're talking about comics, right? Yeah, definitely. Is there actually, a topic? And, and you know what? Yeah, exactly. There isn't a better topic. And actually, uh, for those of you out there, a little bit of trivia about Jim. Jim is the one who actually did the channel logo. Uh, I did. For, for this channel, Jim did the, the channel logo. Yes. <laughs> Somebody getting um, a bit cocky in the comments and saying that you didn't have a good logo. So we had to rectify that situation right away. Exactly. I, I remember it was just when I was getting started and uh, and someone said, you know, you should really make your channel look more professional. And yeah. and Jim Jim was kind enough to step up and uh, he, he... I suppose in a way, logo. he got your new logo. So in yeah. a way, well, my guy. And you know what? And it looks it looks great. And uh, I think I think you're very, very talented. So, you know, uh, thank, you. thank you for doing that again. <laughs> I, I always think that I'm so a person who isn't amazing at drawing, I probably look like I'm really good at drawing. But to a person who's like in the industry and amazing, I will probably look like the jankiest artist out there. <laughs> so many little mistakes. But you um, know what though? I think I think in this day and age, you know, everybody everybody has their own style. And I really like, yeah, like yeah. your style, you know. That's usually I think where people go wrong when they try and mimic someone else's style or do like the conventional Marvel style and uh sort of move into an alien territory but it's just you know do what comes from you and whatever that may be maybe some sorry, weird styles like these guys and stuff right yeah so absolutely not, you know, i think i think and i think we yeah for sure and i think we could say that your your style is more more akin to to, to that i think it's more like a you know you got some humor in, uh, in style, sure. that sort of influence i think yeah exactly for sure Finding, and a lot of that does come from reading indie creators over the years because they do tend to venture a little bit more into that skew if world where things are a little bit more random in how they're constructed you know, the, correct uh, three point perspective isn't necessarily three point there's more four point more bending of things and it's exactly. more interesting visually uh, yeah for sure so tonight we have a uh, really great show lined up for you uh Jim has actually worked in the comic book industry, and uh, we're going to be talking about breaking into the comic book industry, uh, the, the different struggles uh, that new creators could possibly be facing trying to get into the comic book industry, uh, as, yeah. as well as if, if now is even a good time to, 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 to get into the comic book industry. And we're also going to be talking about how comic book art has, uh, has developed over the years, because, I mean, if, if a person takes a comic book uh, from say 40 years ago and you pick up a comic book today, it's, it's completely different. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I've probably got a really old one knocking about somewhere. I've just put a bunch around various places. I can't see my oldest ones. Um, but yeah, even like back to that sort of stuff with the young words compared to, um, say put your Deadpool versus carnage, which is, yeah, a lot more. You know, kind of clean mm -hmm. cut. Yeah, clean cut. Little, little, little yeah. bit darker. Um, a bit more so, time and effort going into it, and money, I guess. For sure. And we have some people that are that are rolling in right now. We want to say hi to Slumberous Whale Three. Welcome to the live stream. I might actually know this guy too. I've I've actually seen him in person. He's a he's a mysterious character. You guys could check out his Twitch channel. Uh, and he's also at Slumber's Whale. Uh, now we also have uh, Samuel David, who just says hello, everyone. So uh, welcome, thanks for hanging out tonight, and uh, let's have a good time here. So, so Jim, let's start off talking a little bit about uh, about you. Uh, how how did you get, get into comic books? How did you know? Like, how did how did this become an obsession for you? I've 
always loved comics since I was a kid, back before it was cool to like comics, when you had to hide your comics from your girlfriend at that time. So um, I just love them, just absolutely love them. And I remember probably 12 years ago now, 12, 13 years ago, uh, being at work and being bored and just reading a webcomic on my phone. I just thought, what? why don't I do that for a living? Why don't I draw stuff and do the things that I did when I was a kid for enjoyment, for money? And it's just been a long, progressive trail to try and make that dream happen since then. And it's a difficult trail to go along, really. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, I think that's, that's, uh, that, that goes, I think, for any sort of uh, creative type career. Right. I mean, if, it, yeah. if, if you're if you're planning to get into art, whether you're or you're poor, there's not a lot of in between. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just just want to give a quick shout out here to David Deister, SZ Vincent and Victor Perez. Uh, welcome. Welcome. I hope you you all enjoy tonight. Uh, we, and we have we have Jim O'Connor with us tonight, who uh, is a freelance about, comic book artist. Nice. My hand. And, uh, oh, look at that. <laughs> awesome line is there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just waving. I thought if anyone wants to, I, I, I genuinely got a plus and minus tattooed on my hands when I was younger. Oh, okay. Oh, so those are tattoos. You didn't just write that off. No, that's genuinely there. The oh, that's genuinely there. <laughs> look at that. Awesome. Um, um, so, so what were your favorite books growing up? Oh, uh, God. Favorites. Um, I particularly liked um, Batman around the period of like Nightfall um, and Asriel, um, probably more so Asriel. I think I always gravitate towards the lesser known characters. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of weird books, Mr. Ro oh, you know, like Bongo and things like that and Diamond comics. There was a lot of them knocking about in the shops where I lived. So it'd be like Simpsons comics or some random one shot of um, like some TV show that's tried to do a comic. Uh, but yeah, have you your ones that most people know, Greenland and Hulk, all those type things. Um, a bookstore near where I lived used to buy old comics from people and then sell them cheap, and they were always ones that people didn't want. So Greenland and <laughs> Hulk <laughs> things that weren't selling as well at the time. Um, but I dug them; they were really cool. Uh, Wolverine, X Men, absolutely adored X Men. Still do. Um, I remember when the first movie came out, going to see that at the cinema, and that was like. A big thing for all the geeks in my family to get together all of us and go and see that i think that's sort of when it kicked off really all the marvel cinematic universe thing that happened so so you you were you basically got into because i i think you're, you're you're somewhat around my age and you got into comics i think at probably the most one of i would I, i'm not going to say the most but one of the most volatile times in, uh, in, in comic books right yeah i mean it went from been a period of time where there was comic book stores in the town that you could go to to pick up your comics. You could pick up comics at uh, grocery stores. And now it's like you're lucky if you've got a comic book store in your town. You usually have to order those things. And the climate of it has just changed drastically. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, so even... We had a cool time, I guess, in a sense, I guess, because that's when it were a lot more of a like a subculture. And I think now it's kind of this big thing where people go to conventions and stuff and um, it's become a bit mainstream. Right. Cool. It's, thing. It didn't it's, used to be. <laughs> it's really strange because it is, it is quite mainstream, but at the same time, I feel like it's becoming a little bit more curated in that, you know, a lot of people, it's just not accessible as it, as, as it was. It's now becoming almost yeah. a, a, a pretentious thing, you know? Yeah, where, definitely. Where, but I think we, um, when you say not accessible, they're, they're, it depends how you look at it because you've probably seen comics without realizing it, like, you know, little memes that are almost like um, basically like what Garfield and stuff used to be in the papers. There's our social media, our interaction with the news is via our computer. So we kind of are still seeing comics in a similar way to what we used to, but it's just evolving into something different. And I think when it's such a weird art form where people like to collect and they like to have that solid issue, you've got to find that right balance of getting people when they want to just go click read and still being able to provide that printed copy that they can collect and keep and love. So. 
Um, Absolutely. So, you so like difficult. At all. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, uh, at what point in time did you realize like, Hey, you know, I, I think I could do that. And I think I definitely want to do that. Um, I don't know. I thought I definitely have an interesting way of drawing and a, a strange imagination. Um, I don't know. I think when I saw probably where are we? Uh, here's my boy, Rob Guillory, my favorite artist uh, from Image. This comic, I think, was the one that really, when I saw it, it was so different. If you can like see the style. Yeah, absolutely. Like, For sure. Case, it costs about 500 quid. I don't know what that is in Canadian, but it's a lot in English. <laughs> um, yep. But it had, let's find, oh, here we go. Here's a, so it's, it's got such a different style that reminded me so much more of that cartoon type style that I like. And I think that sort of gave me permission to draw as me and not as me trying to be Marvel art. It's not trying to be Jim Lee or was Portacio or someone, you know what I mean? Like, right, you definitely developed your own style. And I just yeah. want to uh, address a, a couple comments here first. Uh, David Deister is asking uh, asking me, uh, are you going to talk about the comic industry on the rocks? Because a little earlier he said, Marvel and DC are living long enough to see themselves becoming the villain. And uh, <laughs> I think this is a response right. a little bit to, uh, to a video that we posted a little a uh, couple days ago on the channel uh, talking about uh, the new type of content uh, that uh, Marvel and DC are putting out. So yes, David, we are definitely going to be uh, talking a little bit about that uh, when we talk about art styles, for sure. Uh, and then uh, Robert Fryer here is asking, uh, I believe you in particular, Jim, uh, if there are any thoughts on 2000 AD, because uh, Rob Williams uh, of late has been knocking Judge Dredd out of the park. Uh, what are your thoughts on 2000 AD? Um, I haven't been reading it recently, but as... You know, the people that gave us Tank Girl, one of my all-time favorite stories. It's only going to be good things. It's coming out of England. We're amazing. Now, 2000, <laughs> 2000 AD is more of – is uh, because I've only started hearing about 2000 AD uh, from – like the kind of monthly anthology, I guess. Okay. Have various different uh, stories within it. Uh, Judge yeah. Dredd, um, Rogue Trooper, Tank Girl, when it was in it. I don't think it's in it anymore. Uh, but yeah, usually black and white, and again, really like far out artwork, very wow. unconventional from your usual sort of style. The guy that um, did Gorillas, uh, the band Jamie Hewitt, mm -hmm. something like that, I think he um, he was the artist. Thank you. Absolutely, yeah. So now, and, and, and now, people, uh, a lot of people that I've spoken to in the UK have had nothing but great things to say about. Uh, 2000 AD. So, uh, I mean, it, it would, so you said it's an anthology. Would you say it's, it's quite, um, is it, is it cheap to buy? Cause it's black and white. Uh, yeah. I, I always remembered it being cheaper. And I mean, like I say, I've not bought it in a while cause things don't seem to be like they used to be where you can go into a shop and we don't really have comic stores around here. Um, but it was always bigger as well. Um, it weren't your, your regular comic size. It was more like a, New magazine, I guess. Uh, Almost like yeah. a di like digest size, right? Yeah, yeah, just different. Or Not like super, a kind of, kind of, kind of. I mean, I've never been to Japan. From what, like, what some of those shown in Jump magazines look like? They're like this thick. Is that what? Uh... Yeah, yeah. I think you'd usually get a bit more than you uh, thirty-two pages or twenty-eight pages, or whatever. Um, okay. But just different, very different. An English comic. <laughs> yeah. Like sure, no, it's, it's always great to see to see uh so you know how each country treats comics in, in in a different way so i think it's really important for each nation to have yeah. their own style and you know north stream universe here is saying you know having your own style is huge and i i totally uh totally would would uh would agree with that now uh i wanted to jump in and talk a little bit about uh art styles because we we mentioned a little bit uh, that you know you've you've developed your own kind of style that's kind of unlike uh, anything that that you're seeing nowadays. Like I said, it's a little bit more cartoony, a little bit more yeah. you know, humor. How do you how do you feel in, in general? How how do you think that comic book art has developed over the years? Uh, well, I, it's become um, 
more tribal in a way, delineated. Um, okay, good. you've got your your regular, like you say, Marvel stuff. That's what you expect to see when you buy a comic, like uh, sort of X Men type thing. Just you know, standard comic book color. Yep, as you expect it to be. But then when you do want to go to your indie stuff, you've, you've got, let's say, some really, uh, let's find someone that's a bit out there. Oh, here we go. Yeah. A long time ago, but Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Like you, there are always <laughs> different things out there. It, whether or not they're in the mainstream, um, not always. But, yeah, the, the industry is... Um, it's stayed in its sort of realm. It's got more polished, but I don't think it's ever going to really like cater right down to like the independent artists' um, narrative, like the more deeper and darker stories, because they care about making money. Right, exactly. And I and I think you make a really good point there uh, with uh, with saying that these 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 styles of art now are very delineated and and. There, there are huge differences, right? Because I mean, like, if you looked at a book back in the sixties, sorry, go ahead. Like manga, that's, that's one brand of uh, comics, and it's completely different to anything else that you're going to read from uh, Western world. I mean, pages read backwards, even when it's in English. You'll read from that side to that side. It's very right, <laughs> right, right to you left. Know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, there is a lot of various different types of comics where people are trying to get points across and sort of using um, comics as a platform to push agendas and things. Uh, it's, it's become a very strange place, the comic world. <laughs> Absolutely. And Altogether. speaking speaking of pushing uh, agendas, you know, uh, we definitely see a lot of agenda pushing uh, in, in comic mm. books nowadays. Now, you know, and that's yeah. that's not to say that, you know, Marvel and DC are, you know, aren't putting anything good out. Cause like I said, uh, in, in the video that we posted a couple days ago, there are some great titles out there right now. You know, like immortal Hulk is amazing. Uh, Venom yeah. by Donny Cates, Thor by Donny Cates, you know, like they, they, they have a lot of good stuff out there, but I think the yeah. thing that people are focusing on the most is those, uh, those more I think politically that charged. Oh, I think, I think you might be, Cutting out there a little bit, Jim. There we go. Okay, you just cut out for a second there. Sorry, uh, I, I just missed what you said there. <laughs> Sorry, it was cutting out. Uh, no, I, say, I think, you know, they've got things in the long game with cinematic world and everything, and sometimes it's just publicity stunts. It genuinely is when they start messing with things because uh, they know they can change it in <laughs> six months' time. Absolutely. Now, why do you think they, they, they insist on um publishing particular types of content that people aren't not aren't really receptive to but but they but they keep kind of publishing it so what do you think they're trying to accomplish with that um i think it depends on like with the issues um say they've got an issue that's showing like decline in sales and their projections saying you know we're gonna lose another 10 percent in six months of our clientele for that if they do nothing, that's going to happen. If they do something really janky and crazy that's going to stir up conversation and um, you know, get people in instantly talking about the comic again, it might raise the sales up. It might cause a lot of the people that are already buying it to drop out and they'll have a lower sale. But at the same time, you might get a lot of new people that wouldn't have been interested in that comic and it's where it's going to fall. If their calculations say it's going to fall slightly above then that's what they're going to do because they want the money so it really just depends on their market research and if it's something that they're falling back on and doing a lot it's probably just lazy work on their behalf that they're just like right let's do that again that worked last time yeah absolutely and and i mean i think, it speaks I think absolutely definitely Actually, speaks volumes and you can you can definitely see uh this reflected a little bit in the art styles because you know if you take if you take comic books in the 19 90s everybody was trying to draw their characters like buff and really fit and really really kind of kind of yeah. bad looking right and, 
right and, and and nowadays you still you still have some of that i mean like like the the work on on immortal hulk right now is is, is amazing it's really you know bad looking it looks awesome but uh, then you're starting to see some some really kind of juvenile type styles. And, and one thing, I mean, that uh, the Luciano uh, Vecchio uh, work on uh, the new New Warriors there, that, that looked quite juvenile. As well as I'm thinking even to like Umberto Ramos, uh, he was on Spider-Man for a really, really long time. And, and I, I, I read Spider-Man at that time for a while. And I just, I never really liked I that style. The comic to uh, illustrate your point. Let's see. <laughs> I can, uh, Sorry, I was just taking it. a look at a, uh, some comments here. Yeah. Let's see if we can find this. While you're looking for that, I'm just going to address here. Um, Rodney Johnson here saying, uh, "I know, I know, you're having a serious conversation. I know. I'd hate to interrupt, but you're both experts. Any opinions on Garth Ennis's crossed?" Do you have any opinions on Garth oh. Ennis' Crossed? I've not, not encountered it. You know what? And to tell you the truth, uh, I'm sorry, Rodney. Uh, neither have I. <laughs> I know the name Garth Ennis, but uh, <laughs> oh, I unfortunately uh, haven't um, oh, you? encountered it. <laughs> yeah. Um, right here, for instance, like, that's a book. Uh, it's a one-shot uh, mystery in space book. Yeah. When you look at the style, that is definitely not your standard Marvel comic book type style. Um, right. So there's a, a mix. That's Vertigo. One shots. One shots incredibly good for getting artwork out into the world if you're an artist. So, so you're right. It's not your standard Marvel. Uh, but uh, why, why do you think uh, Marvel is uh, contracting some of these artists that maybe have a little bit more, uh, let's say, family friendly style? Um, I, th I think it's just to gauge the audience, you yeah. know, try and see what works. And I think sometimes you, you're going to connect more with um, a younger audience who are most likely going to be the people that are going to be bugging their parents to buy stuff um, and going to have the most um, highest impact in terms of sales of merchandise and things like that. And, of course, if you're drawing in a more cartoon style, it's a lot easier to put it on a lunchbox or... Um, you know, a sweatshirt, for instance. You know, if everything looks like spun and it's angry and nasty, parents aren't going to be wanting <laughs> the kids walking around in that. I, I think that's definitely a great point. Uh, I, I definitely think uh, Marvel, especially nowadays, is trying to... Uh, they're maybe trying to sell merchandise with their books, perhaps. Or maybe because maybe of their merchandise, of they, they want to drop people in. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things at play. I think they want to just you know, see what things work, introduce new stories in um, in different styles, try older stories in different styles, and just see what connects. And again, like I say, it's all down to where that graph falls when they get the figures back. That's what determines what they're going to do. You know, if, if they put a bunch of stuff out there and it sucked and nobody bought it, they'd stop doing it real fast. Absolutely. <laughs> and... Uh... <laughs> And uh, Rodney's just saying uh, he appreciates us addressing the question. Uh, it's a really dark brand. No worries. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't we didn't know about it. And uh, Rodney's saying I'm a legend. Thank you so much, Rodney. I really appreciate the uh, the positive feedback there. Uh, David Deister saying, uh, I, David. By the way, I hope I'm saying your 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 last name correctly. If I if I'm butchering it, I'm sorry. Uh, Marvel's at the end of their uh, creative rope, and Adrian Benningfield says hello. Welcome, Adrian. Uh, so Marvel being oh. at the end of their uh, creative rope here, uh, would you would you agree with that? I think we had Jim come out, cut out here a little bit. So uh, while we're waiting for uh, Jim, oh there he is. Sorry, you cut out again, Jim. <laughs> so so uh, what do you think? Do you think they're at the end of their creative yeah. rope? Or No, they've got enough money to generate a creative rope. I mean, they're, they're never going to run short of ideas. I mean, at a certain point, people are going to stop wanting to read the same characters, but again, they're going to keep changing them up and recycling the same stuff while they can. And I think they can still do it. Absolutely. And and, and you know what? 
at, at the same time too, I think it's really important to uh, to consider the commercial side of this. Uh, Marvel is no longer a company that is just making comic books. They have they have films. They have they have a line of toys. Individual characters. They're thinking, how's this character going to fit into the cinematic universe? We've got to represent this person, this diversity range in the cinematic universe. How do we change it at this level to do it up here? So they're always thinking like a million steps ahead. Absolutely. So now they're not only just focusing on, hey, what do the readers want to see? But they're thinking, yeah, hey, can I tie this into the uh, the MCU? Can I can I make toys from this? And I mean, this, this really isn't anything that's particularly new. I mean, heck, Marvel's been doing this. Marvel and DC have been doing this since, since the 1980s. And I know you and I uh, were talking a little bit about Secret Wars yesterday. Uh, why, don't, why don't we talk a little bit about Secret Wars? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about that little... Uh, yeah. Very deliberate targeting by Marvel. Down, like even, I don't think the name even really makes any sense when you look at it. But um, that's what their focus group said they deemed were the best two words that they wanted to see on the front of a comic. That's what they put on a comic. That's how clinical they are in um, their delivery of targeted merchandise absolutely and, and, and actually it was, it was really funny i did a little bit of research on this uh, because we talked about it yesterday uh, basically what happened was uh, in, in the 80s uh, a toy company initially reached out to dc to make a, a line of toys because uh toy companies were were jumping on the action figure train because uh, what came out before well this little film called star wars and uh, Star Wars action figures mm -hmm. sold like hotcakes. So now this toy company reaches out to DC and says, hey, we want to make a line of toys with your, with, uh, with your characters. Well, then what happens is Mattel gets wind of this. They call Jim Shooter, who's the editor-in-chief at the time, and they say, hey, our competition is going to make a toy line with your competition, so uh, we want to make some toys uh, with your characters. What do you think? And you know, Jim Shooter at the time is thinking like, yeah, absolutely, let's do that. And you know, like you said, they did the research. They had the fo they had the focus group, and the two words for those of you that don't know, the two words that uh, kids at the time, young adults, responded to the most were secret and wars. So they took those two words, put them together. Wars obviously is coming from you know from Star Wars. You know, Star Wars got big success, but then secret for, for some reason uh, came came out of that. And Louis just popped Here in. Louis, yeah, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Hey. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, so Secret yeah. Wars, yeah, you know, like uh it's it's definitely That's something that, it's definitely something uh, that, that they've been doing for a while. And then I mean Liefeld and uh and, and McFarlane, all those guys later on in, in the nineties, they were doing that that exact same thing with uh with with, with their characters, man. right? Yeah. I don't know, that's that that's okay. Um, so do you think nowadays, uh, when, when, when you're, when you have in mind that you want to be a comic book creator, do you not only have to be a comic book creator, but you have to be at the same time, a toy marketer or, uh, you know, a, a filmmaker, like, what, what do you think? Do you, do you have to have that? Well, extent, I mean, it depends how you, um, how you want to go about it. I suppose if you look at, um, like here's a good example, you might remember the cartoon of like that guy. Okay, yeah. Hair. Okay, yep, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the comics were designed to be a toy range from the get-go. So in the comics they even have the the holes in the bottom of the feet which you wouldn't have ordinarily. So people do do that and they can think about it. But at the same time one of the great things about comics is it costs the same amount of money to draw a spaceship as it does to draw a car. So a person who doesn't have you know, $50 million budget can still create a cinematic masterpiece on paper. Um, so as much as people have to think about that stuff, I guess, to an extent, from a financial extent, from an artistic extent, I think it's nice to, um, you know, remember why you're telling the story and yeah, use absolutely. the medium as best as possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just had a, just had another question here from rodney rodney thanks for asking the questions tonight buddy <laughs> um he says okay so i know my last question was a dead end 
uh, opinions on Marvel Zombies got to be my favorite series. H have you read Marvel Zombies, uh, Jim? I've. This is my entire experience of Marvel Zombies. When I can. I uh oh, I think we got something big coming here. <laughs> well, Jim's looking. I'll just. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know, Rodney. Uh, I've not really read much of uh, Marvel Zombies, but I do have some somewhere. <laughs> um, I just Rodney, put all the comics in a I can get to them, and I have no idea where any are now. No, that, that that's yeah. okay. Uh, so, so what do you th what do you think about uh, Marvel Zombies? I mean, you've read it, right? I've not read any, but I love. I just love the idea of it. I think it's great. Okay. See characters ripping each other's bits. Wonderful. Uh, and and, <laughs> and, and honestly, big fan of, to be fair, I went through a wicked zombie phase where I just spent all my time watching zombie movies. I think you and, and many many other people when The Walking Dead started becoming uh, popular um, and yeah yeah it was a little bit before Walking Dead I just randomly got into zombies I must have seen something somewhere um, but yeah it was just around that time it was great to sort of be really into that topic when it hit <laughs> absolutely and and to answer and Rodney I'm just going to answer uh, Rodney's question here uh, what do I think of Marvel Zombies I I, I freaking loved it uh, I think it's brilliant. Uh, I, I definitely think there was a little bit of, um, you know, trying to capture the zeitgeist and pull it out of the bottle and, and definitely make a lot of money out of it. And I definitely think Marvel did that. Uh, but at the same time, they created something amazing and refreshingly original. Uh, I remember reading that and thinking how beautifully gruesome it was. Like when, when all the zombies just devoured galactus uh really really great i that was i think that was my favorite scene and then my other favorite scene was uh because what happens in this book is when the zombies uh eat when they eat people uh they they then kind of go back to to who they were with the, with their own uh morality for a little bit so peter parker he eats somebody and then he thinks like oh my goodness i ate my aunt may and i ate mary jane and it was just such a such a you know darkly funny moment in marvel's zombies and, and i just i just thought it, i thought it was brilliant and uh i have the trade and i i'll probably read it again at some point it was just just great um a couple of anthology type things somewhere that my dad had bought for me and i honestly can't remember where i've put them i've seen them in the last hour or so but well, yeah if you find them just uh just yeah definitely, but, uh, definitely pull them up so zombies were were definitely huge at one point we were we were talking yesterday uh, that if, if you're going to make a pitch to uh, an independent company, uh, an independent publisher, yeah. like even Im Image right on their website says, do not submit it, any zombie-related stuff. Yeah, at one point it genuinely said on um, the submissions page, no more zombie stuff, just because they were getting inundated. Blokes like to write post-apocalyptic things. Um, so so is that what's, what's hot right now? Um, I don't... I don't know what they're um, if they're you know if they've got an embargo on any particular style at the minute or anything. Um, but there's been times when I've gone to other websites and it said only accepting um, females, <laughs> female writers. So there are definite times where they've got a specific quota that they've got to reach. Um, I guess if they've got a stack of zombie books this high, and, I don't know, detective books this high, they want more detective less zombie. So. So, so, and you're saying like right now, uh, kind of post-apocalyptic stuff is what's trending. Oh, right now. I don't know. Um, I don't know so much about what people are reading or buying, but definitely in terms of what is being presented to editors and the people looking at submissions, what I would say is predominantly going to be post-apocalyptic sci-fi stuff from dudes, um, predominantly written from the perspective of a male. Um, so, if anyone wants to mix the game up and just write it with a female protagonist, you've probably got a book that's going to do well and be different from um, every other post-apocalyptic story that's in there. Um, but yeah, that type of thing. With girls, they tend to write books about witches or stories about witches. Mix it up, and you, you're not going to be in a big pile of a hundred of the same things. Correct. Now, uh, also, I, wanna, I wanted to ask the viewers, uh, let me all know uh, what you think is trending right now. Uh, let us know. Let us know in the comments. And for those of you just joining us, uh, we are here with uh, freelance comic book creator Jim O'Connor. 
Uh, if you'd like to send a super chat and help support the channel, uh, donations are definitely always appreciated. Th special thank you to Adrian Benningfield for uh, his donations last week, and also this old stone nerd, who I don't think is with us tonight. Uh, just he has, he has an awesome name, but uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, so you're basically basically what you're saying. It's not really. Right now, it's not really what um, the quality. You, so let me get this straight: Is it not the quality of the story that is important right now, but more the demographic of it? Um, I think quality is always what matters. But you've you've got to kind of fit into it. Like you know, you're saying about what was trending. If you look at what a particular company is releasing, how you're going to fit into that framework. If your stuff is so polar opposite that it's you know, you're going to be marginalizing the audience rather than working as one big unit. The company is going to be less likely to take on your work. So I think you just have to be mindful of what it is you're doing, who you're making that story for. Um, never like compromise the story so much. And, but understand if you're writing a story, it could be the best po post-apocalyptic story in the world with a dude as a protagonist, straight white male dude but it's probably not going to be that dissimilar to a million other versions of that story written by other people yours might be groundbreaking and better than anything out there in the world but is it going to get read and it's sat in a big pile with other stuff so i'd say more just if you're starting out go with the stuff that you know will create an impact and will stand out and then once you've got a name for yourself then you can start telling these other stories that are a little bit more um, difficult to pitch as a, a new creator. So, uh, you know, and um, for any of the, uh, the view, for any of our viewers uh, tonight that are looking to break into the comic book industry, uh, what type of advice would you give for uh, content of the story? Because like, like you're saying, you know, you really gotta, gotta think about what type of uh, character that, yeah. that, or what type of story you're, you're going to tell until you've made a name for yeah. yourself. Yeah. Um, I think if for, for writers, etc., if you genuinely looking at working in the comic industry, um, I'd maybe just look at writing stories around comics that, um, you read, um, that, you know, have one shots occasionally or, um, artists change a lot in terms of writers or actual artists, if you're going as an artist. And, and start catering your work to that. And then when you apply to the company, you can say, I'm, I'm, I'm applying to try and fill this sort of position. So just, it really depends where you want to go into it. But like in the, the easiest approach is, I would say to slip into the industry that way, because that way you're just pushing yourself as a writer. You're not pushing your characters and your story as well. Um, yeah. So basically, baby steps. Basically, baby steps. So basically, you're you got to show what you can do, not not what you can offer. Yeah, kind of say, um, I see what you guys are doing. I can see that you're going to need someone at this point, and you've probably got a million people asking. Um, so I'm going to show you what I can do in this specialized area and try and just fit into that small little category rather than coming straight out the gate and being, I want to do this entire right draw, make the entire thing um, where they'll probably, you know, no, you, you're going to burn yourself out far too quick. Um, Absolutely. Now, uh, before I get on to the, um, to the next question, I just wanted to uh, address uh, Victor Perez's uh, question. Uh, any, any uh, opinions on uh, Kurt uh, Buziak and Alex Ross's Astro City? Have you read Astro City? No, I have not. No, what, I actually that? Is that which, uh, dynamite. Uh, it was, I believe it was. It, it, it's a '90s book. Was it published by DC? Help me out, guys. Uh, <laughs> Astro City was that? Was that? Was that DC? I actually, I read it a long time ago. Uh, I don't remember enough of it. Uh, to to really if it was popular it. enough, it's probably somewhere in my loft. Yeah, it was it was pretty popular. It was it was actually I remember it being quite quite oh. brilliant, and the art is stunning. I mean, any anything by Alex Ross, any any Alex Ross art is always stunning. Uh, he uh, 
he always hand paints everything and it's just it's just gorgeous to look at uh let's see here uh, and uh ronnie johnson here is also saying uh appreciate you jim your opinion is a breath of fresh air so yeah. you're doing a good Thank job you. jim <laughs> speaking appreciate of you. uh who who's your um who's your favorite jim at marvel there were a lot of gems at Marvel. Do you have any yeah, favorite gems? Favorite, uh, Jim at Marvel. I don't even know now. Nah. Yeah. Who's at Marvel now? Well, I mean, at, at any time in history. I Jim Lee, in terms of art, um, I guess he was at Marvel at some point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Jim Lee definitely <laughs> was at Marvel. Yeah, I remember sure. doing Spider-Man, definitely. Um, I honestly don't know. I'd go Jim Lee. I think. Yeah. Jim Lee, yeah, I mean, because there's for, you know, me, maybe. for me, it's probably Jim Steranko, just because he was he was just oh, okay, so cool. yeah, yeah, he's such a yeah, such, yeah, he's such character. a badass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Didn't lightly, did he? That guy, right? Yeah, exactly. He's, he's <laughs> that's Bob Kane, eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, for those of you watching tonight, let me know if you knew that Jim Steranko smacked Bob Kane across the face at one point. Uh, if you didn't know that, uh, I want to hear from you because you need to find out about it. Because it's, it's, it's done something where he kept really doing really something like really little and irritating and annoying, like demeaning to him over a period of time, weren't it? Yeah, ba basically what happened was, uh, so so Jim Steranko wrote a book called The History of Comics and, uh, at, at, a, at a con in, uh, I think it was back in the mid-70s at some point, uh, Bob Kane went up to Jim Steranko and basically started started arguing with him a little bit, saying like, "Hey, you know, uh, you know, like you gave you gave uh, Jerry Robinson too much credit for the Joker, and you gave Bill Finger way too much credit for 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 Batman. You know, like I I, I was the man behind all that. You know, typical Bob Kane stuff. You know, and uh, and then at one point, uh, when when the conversation was said and done, like Jim Steranko at this point was already pissed off, right? You know, he's like, "Who the heck is this guy trying to tell me how to write my book?" You know, uh. So before the, before they part, uh, Bob Kane just looks looks J Jim Stranko in the eye and says, "See you later, Jim, baby." And then he cups him across <laughs> the face, kind of like a smack, you know, like a condescending smack. So Jim Stranko the next day went up to him, tapped him on the shoulder, and said, "Hey, remember me?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, Stranko." And he's like, "Smack!" Just told he's like, "I bitch slapped him across the face," and then he's like, "See you later, <laughs> Bob, baby." <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, nice. my favorite story in comic books, <laughs> you know, just just considering the type of person that Bob Kane was, right? You know, so and uh, and speaking speaking of Bob Kane, the whole Bill Finger thing, um, I have a very special surprise for all of you. Uh, I'm not going to make any announcements about it yet, but uh, probably a little later on in the week, I have a very special announcement about the whole Batman and Bob Kane and Bill Finger thing. So stay tuned for that, Jim. Treat. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm, be I'm being mysterious, you know, like tales of suspense, journey into mystery <laughs> with Dante D. Uh, so you were talking about one shots. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you're, if you're going to, if you're going to make a submission to a company, do you suggest, um, submitting like a six issue arc for a character or just a one shot? Um, I guess it depends if you've got, <sighs> It's, there's so many variables involved. If you've got the funding to pay for a, an artist, if you're a writer, or if you're you know an artist, you've got a writer, and you've got everything happening where you can make that work, um, make the comic, and then try and sell it, that's great. But it's a lot of work to get six issues done. Um, and you've, you've got to show that you can stay up to the task of doing that work and getting that work done in time. If you feel that you've got the credibility to make that a viable option for the company, it might work, but you've got a much better chance of doing something like a one shot, you know, start small, build up from there. And and then, yeah, like you say, a mini series, something like, um, yeah. Uh, what we got? Like you, like Moriarty that ran, that ran about nine issues. Yep. It, it may not have sold amazing, but I don't think they lost money, so they're probably pretty happy. 
that's where you want to be. <laughs> yeah, you exactly. don't want to be the guy that's losing the money, essentially. Um, and a one issue thing, you, you probably, even if it sucks, you're not going to cause that much damage. So that's a better route as a beginner, I think, to you know, manage your expectations because they'll manage your expectations when you apply. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many of those things. If you look across all your different uh, platforms, you've got one shot after one shot. People will put out or anthologies and stuff. Um, people will put out graphic novels. And these are good ways to, you know, pitch these kind of ideas that are very um, stuck in a time frame. So that the people that you're pitching to know exactly how long you're going to be working and whether or not you can fit that into a, a viable plan. Um, if you've got two people, you've got to provide twice as much income. So you've got to sell twice as many comics. Are you going to be able to do that? Is the person that's doing the artwork or the story not going to be able to cope? drop out are you going to be burning out by doing too much work there's so many variables and the more you can limit that and show the companies that you're pitching to that you can work in their frame and you can um, work to a particular standard to a particular time frame that that's going to help you isn't it basically because it's going to look good that's what, that's what they're going to want to see they need to see that prove if um if you can go into education I'd say because that instantly, if that if you can say I study art or I studied art, they'll know that you can stick to a course, get work done at a particular rate, um, to a particular standard. So anything that you can do that will, when you're writing your sub uh, submission, that will demonstrate that you can do the work that you say you're doing, or will be able to do, uh, to the standard that you say. Now, what do you think are the the uh, the greatest challenges facing somebody, whether they be a writer, artist, or both, trying to break into the comic book industry? Oh, sheer number of people, because it's a big world, and the internet and computers have made it a lot easier to do artwork, to to put artwork out there, and you know it's a big pond, and there's a, a lot of fish swimming in it. So the, the biggest thing is getting yourself seen amongst the crowd and how are you going to do that? Are you going to do it by being obnoxious and bothering people on Twitter and stuff? Probably not a good idea. You make more enemies than you will friends. Um, so you've got to look at how you're going to get your work from this big pile of submissions to a small pile of submissions. And you, you can do that through um, going to conventions and entering local competitions. Uh, a lot of comic book companies will do that. They'll have a little uh, competition section where you maybe do um, six pages. They'll give you a six-page script. You draw it out, and you know maybe 200 people enter. The winner will get their work published in a particular anthology that's coming out. And that way, you're you're making that pile of people that you're competing against that much smaller. Right. 200 to 20,000 you're that much closer to getting to speak to somebody who works at that company who you then will you know, be able to speak to back and forth without looking like a crazy random person. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, and, and, and you've, you've had quite a, quite a few hardships uh, yourself uh, in, in this industry. Uh, I mean, you told me some oh, yeah. stories. Do you want very to share naive. any stories? <laughs> yeah, very, very naive in my ways at first, expecting to um, – just go in and companies to be like, yeah, we'll pay you to do this. We'll take that chance. No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> right. Does it, doesn't, all, doesn't always work that way, right? Yeah, exactly. There's, they, you see the odd story of somebody who will um, say they pitched this idea, and got, but it, it, there's usually a lot more at play. They know somebody who works at the company and have a direct communication. Um, yeah, it's it's never as simple as what a lot of people would like others to think. Even Robert Kirkman, I know he got himself into a massive amount of debt in the initial stages, even when he was at Image, um, just paying like his artist. And he was lucky that he'd got someone that could support him during that time as well, and it did pay off for him. But even as a, an artist that was working at Image with a comic that was out being sold, there would have been times when he would have been really scared still 
financially speaking. Oh, um, absolutely. For sure. Even you realize that that's, that's going to be the case. It, you know, you, you don't just get a job working as a comic artist and all of a sudden you've got Ferraris and girls hanging off your arms. <laughs> I don't know if anybody thinks that's what the comic book world's like. But... Well, you know what, though? Actually, um, I mean, that's not the case anymore, but there was a time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Life felt much smaller than that were rock stars in their day. I mean, like, uh, you know, I, I, I've read stories of, you know, back back in the heyday of, of comics in the, in the 90s when, you know, when they were just hot sellers. Jim Shooter, who was an amazing editor-in-chief for a bit, he, he was a tough nut to crack, but he was an amazing editor-in-chief. He actually made it so uh, a lot of the artists and writers could collect royalties from, from the books. And uh, the books that they were selling at the time, like, they were selling some of them in, in the millions, Big like... Number. Yeah. Uh, Rob Liefeld himself talks about how, you know, Mark Silvestri, he, he had like this big house. He had, he had like a silver Porsche and everything. Liefeld himself, he was able to buy himself and his parents a house. Um, you know, how much did Carlton spend on that baseball? That, that got right. into like millions or something. I think it went yeah, ridiculous. Like, like these guys were just raking in the cash. And Liefeld at the time was, he was only maybe like 22, 23 years old. And he's making all this cash. You got to think this guy was making, even if he was only making 5% royalties off these books. Export Levi's commercial at some point as well. Like, yeah, you did a Levi's commercial. Absolutely, oh, you're actually that in the public arena. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I got him in the public arena, but even so, like, like people just liked his art, and uh, you know, even if he's only making five percent commission or five percent royalties, uh, X Force number yeah. one, I think, sold five million copies. <laughs> so that's a nice check, even if you're only making five percent, right? Yeah. So, but I think I definitely think those days are gone. And I think it's pretty safe to say, Jim, if you agree with me, that uh, you don't get into any form of art, whether it be visual art, uh, uh, novels, uh, comic books, if you want to make money. You, you literally, you got to yeah. do it for the love of it. We all need money to get by, but yeah, you've got to do it out of a desire to do that sort of stuff. Um, I think most people... You know, if you're going into it, you you probably on some level do. A lot of people might not have the correct level of respect and go into it far more naively and um, arrogantly than they should do, but they get reality checked. <laughs> they either stick yeah. with it if they love it or they don't. Uh, yeah, I, you're, you're absolutely right about that, you know. So, I mean... It's uh, it, you know, it's a crazy world, and it's 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 definitely getting crazier, especially in in the entertainment industry. And actually, you've uh, you've left comics uh, uh, temporarily for now. You're now focusing on writing your your novel. Yeah, um, it's more of a it's not so much choice that I've left comics. I'm just in a, a situation I can't afford to pay an artist. I haven't got the time to devote my own time to doing that art. So, in order to get my story that I want made and um, published, I I have to find an approach that will work with my current life. Um, maybe it's going to be a really janky, zigzaggy line to get to doing comics, but hopefully it will get me there. But I think that's the thing people have to realise is you have to be realistic. You Just because you want to write and draw this comic uh, as a monthly thing, it doesn't mean that you're physically able to do that or that um, yeah, it's going to be the quickest and easiest way to get that um, that stuff out there by just making it. Uh, it's not necessarily going to work. You have to think about what it is you're doing, who it is that's going to be uh, marketing your work, who's going to be buying it, and take all that into consideration. Usually it's a case of simplifying. Absolutely. And just... Uh... I, I just want to address one of the comments here. Uh, Adrian uh, Benningfield is saying, is Liefeld the exception to uh, to reality check? I would definitely say yes. Uh, definitely an exception to reality check. He's definitely not the rule. Uh, Scott and Falconhood424, welcome. Just just popped in. And uh, I think, yeah, Fre Fresho78 thinks been here for a while. But if I didn't say hi to you, welcome as well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, Liefeld... Yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen him draw feet, ever. <laughs> He's getting better at that. He just released uh, Snake Eyes for IDW, yeah. and his feet are getting better. Very good, very good. Actually, I got one upstairs coming from a front cover where, like, a, a Beast-type character, it might be X-Force, has got two um, 
right feet or two left feet and four toes on one foot and five on the other. You know what? But the, it, the passion was, it yeah, was a passionate image. He'd exactly. Like this guy, he, he absolutely loves comics. Like for him, it wasn't just a job. Like this guy was one of the few guys on the planet who got the, the uh, rare opportunity to basically do what he loves, do, do his hobby and get paid crap load of cash for it. Right. So uh, I, I, I just yeah. think he's, he's been definitely one of the luckiest guys, you know, um, for, for that matter. And, you know, things are still going well for him. Uh, he's still getting work. Uh, people love him. He's got yeah. millions of followers <laughs> on, uh, on social media. So. Deadpool and, uh, everybody loves Deadpool. Exactly. So. Every, everyone loves Deadpool and uh, you know, He's still making rope. He's, he's, like he's pretty cool still. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, definitely definitely some exciting things. You, you know, despite everything that's going on in the comic, comic industry right now, um, you know, I, I definitely still think there are some, some exciting things uh, going on and things to look forward to as well. Uh, now, uh, we, we, just, we just have a few, few, uh, few more minutes here before, uh, before we have to wrap it up. But uh, any, any closing remarks? Any... Uh, any advice you'd like to give for any uh, aspiring comic book creators right now? Um, oh, sort of. Yes, I guess. Um, it depends on who I'm speaking to, but in general, simplify. Go the simple, the better. Don't pitch yourself as one big thing, like one comic, one story, one artwork style. The more you can break it and pull it back and look at where you want to be, and try and get there through planning and um how to put it baby steps baby. simplify it. if you want to be an artist don't go pitching a full comic to them give them little six or seven pages of sequential art um and pitch yourself as somebody who's going to fit into their framework essentially sorry that's not much of a closing statement that's very wordy actually weren't it <laughs> No, that, that that was great. It was very, very uh, eloquently put. Uh, and the other thing I think people should really keep in mind, is, you know, like, uh, the other thing that people should really keep in mind is that you know, whether you're pitching a, a novel or 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 a comic book or or, or something, right? Uh, yeah, you have to be okay with rejection. Uh, rejection oh, definitely. is, is definitely. a part of this gig, right? And uh, you have to be relentless. And you just have to be okay with getting rejected, re rejected, and you have to be okay with receiving criticism. And heck, I'm learning from it definitely. Yeah. Right, and I mean, even if your your book or your comic is good, you know, just because it's not getting published now, does not necessarily mean it won't get published in the future. Stick yeah. it on a shelf, wait for for cultural trends to, to to change, and then when you think the time is right, take it off the shelf, dust it off, and try again. You know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Once your name is known, people are going to be willing to read your stuff. And, at, you know, at that point, maybe something you wrote 10 years ago might be really popular. But you've got to think of how you're getting into the industry. How are you going to get someone to turn that first page? Because that's the hardest thing to do. Right. Um, you can draw the best comic in the world. If nobody's turning that first page, nobody's going to see it. So, well, you well need put. To a way to do that. And, Often that's putting it out there for free, um, doing these competitions and things like that, just working at it in, in small ways rather than aiming straight for the top. I've made this. Right. So. <laughs> well, very, very well put. And uh, I, you know, I think that's some, some really great advice. If, uh, if you all there uh, that are watching right now uh, would like to check out some of Jim's work, you can follow him on social media. You're, you're currently posting uh, one chapter of your book per month, correct? Yes, that is right. That, essentially, just using social media in a way that I think works. People don't like to be inundated with too much stuff. Um, I try and put page out daily. Um, just make it easy access for people. If they're on the train, they can read it for free. Right, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I actually had a peek at it. It's quite you're, – you're, you're quite the funny guy, I have to say. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're quite clever. I think I think you have that. I think you know, and I think I think you have that signature what we would call uh, here in North America British humor. Yeah, it's um, it's 
surprises me how stereotypical I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Drink my tea yeah, from there. You go. Yeah, God save the oh. queen, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh but uh but anyway yeah you can follow uh you can follow jim on uh on twitter it's at, at jim o'connor right i think so yeah I I'll, I'll i'll put I it in the description over there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah it's on twitter at jim o'connor if you want to check out some jim, of uh you know, jim's current work uh and i'd like to thank you all for uh for popping in and hanging out with us tonight and uh and talking with jim o'connor jim thanks so much for being What's on up? the show uh, oh, and, thank you for you. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. Always, always great to chat. And uh, I have a very, like I said a little earlier on in the show, I have a very special surprise for everyone. Stay tuned. I'm not going to say anything yet, but uh, in a few weeks' time, uh, there's something kind of big going to be happening. Okay, so uh, stay tuned. I'm going to be posting a video in which I'll probably uh, talk about it. New video will exciting. be posted. Yeah, it, I think it, I think it will be kind of exciting, and I think a lot of people on the channel will will like this uh, surprise. Uh, new video will be posted on Sunday, so stay tuned for that. And uh, as always, thank you so much. Stay geeky, and it's Friday. It's Friday geeks, so let's go out there and have some fun. Thanks, Jim, once again, and uh, we'll be Thanks. seeing you all in the next episode. Have a good night. Take care. Good night, guys.